Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Welcome to the residents at Valley Farm here in Ashland. I'm glad that you are all able to come and attend this evening's event. Um, I think it'll be very informative and educational for folks. And um, one of our attendees shared with me on the way in that she didn't know we were here. So I just want to give a little bit of a recap for those folks that aren't familiar with our community. How could they have not noticed? I know. <laughs> <laughs> we are absolutely wide open. We had residents move in September 1st when we opened our doors. Uh, we do offer independent assisted and memory care. We are a rental community. We have 80 apartments. 60 of those apartments include studio one and two bedrooms and those are in the second and third floors of where you are currently. And then we also have a memory care neighborhood which is on our first floor and we have 20 apartments there including two companion suites. Um, we offer a lot of amenities, uh, inclusive cost here, uh, programming. We have a wonderful reflections director whom you'll be meeting shortly, Emily Boschemann. Um, and we will be around to give you tours and offer, um, answer any questions which you may have this evening. So um, I'm going to introduce Arthur Bergeron, our elder care attorney that will be uh, starting off the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dixie. Hi, my name is Arthur Bergeron. Um, for those of you who haven't been at a presentation of mine, I'm an elder law attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. Myrick O'Connell has 60 lawyers. I do this. Um, there are 20 of us in Westboro. There are 40 of us in um, Worcester. I'm just going to move here so that I can see everybody. Good. Um, and as I mentioned, this is all that I do. Um, and and uh, and for fo and well, let me tell you about kind of who my clients are. My clients are typically Frank and Mary. Um, my typical clients are Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And I always tell people, if you get that joke, you're old enough to be my client. Um, the, 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 the goal of Frank and Mary is fairly straightforward. They've got some assets. Frank and Mary start to start off for living at home. They own a home itself. It's worth $600,000. They got a nice house. Um, he is an IRA worth $200,000. They have an annuity worth seventy-five. dollars They get bank accounts worth seventy-five. dollars So they have total assets of $950,000. They've done okay, they've got some savings, it's not huge. Uh, Frank has got uh, social security and a pension. Uh, Frank, social security of 1,500 a month and a pension of 500 a month for a total of 2,000. Mary's getting uh, um, 1,500 a month on social security because she had worked a lot herself, so she's on her own social security number. Um, so they're doing okay. They're getting uh, about $3,500 a month in income, so over $40,000 a year. Um, and they're gonna be fine and they've been fine. Uh, and, and everybody's goal is to stay home, just to continue and keep visiting the kids. You know, you spend some money on visiting the kids and otherwise everything is fine and you go along and you hope nothing bad's gonna happen. Their goal is to die and be buried in the backyard. It's very simple. Um, their goal, if one of them dies, all things being equal is to leave everything to the other one. And then if the two of them have died, to have things divided up, divide up among the kids. This probably sounds kind of familiar about kind of where people wanna go. But one of the possible, and one of the things we talked about the last time we did a presentation here, and it was about a month ago now, is we talked about, so if you're just at home and you're kind of slowing down and you're trying to figure it out, you're trying to figure out, so should I stay home or is there a point at which I want to be living in assisted living? For most folks, the answer to that is obvious. I want to stay home. They like being at home. And as I always tell folks, in that situation, the question is, it's great to be at home uh, as long as it's safe, right? And as long as home is still a place where you're like socializing and stuff, because sometimes folks who have gotten to be Frank and Mary's age are living in the neighborhood that has gone away. They're living in a place where everybody has kind of like moved. So they're actually in their old neighborhood, but really not knowing that many people. And in that situation, oftentimes assisted living is a great choice because it's really a community of folks who are, not wanna say the same age, but of a relatively similar age. But, the, but the, another issue arises if Mary gets Alzheimer's or any of the diseases that cause dementia and is saying to herself, and Frank is saying to himself, whether they're in the kind of early stages or later stages, so do I really wanna stay at home, right? Because there are options in this case. They're all, at all times, no matter what, Mary is saying, I do not wanna be in a nursing home. Nobody ever wants to be in a nursing home. The, real, the three possibilities for Mary in this case, there are three possibilities. There could be a nursing home. There could be home care, staying at home and getting home care because if Mary has 
the later stages of dementia, she really needs often more than just having Frank be there in order for her to be able to stay at home because otherwise Frank's going to drop dead. Frank's not going to be able to sustain taking care of Mary all the time and being at home. Um, or um, there is assisted living. So I want to talk about the first two for a couple of minutes. Uh, and then, because you, want, you need to kind of know those and be comfortable with them as they relate to assisted living. So, if Mary needs to go to a nursing home, you need to understand this, and many people don't realize this. If Mary needs to go to a nursing home because she just feels a, a home just is going to be impossible and assisted living, too, just isn't going to work, and if they're in this asset situation, um, Mary can almost immediately qualify for Mass Health, which is the Massachusetts name for Medicaid. That's important to know because if she is in a nursing home for more than 90 days, or excuse me, for more than 100 days, even if she's just recovering from an illness, um, Medicare will stop paying for those days. So she's either on private pay or she's on Mass Health. But in this situation, she could fairly quickly qualify for Mass Health. The reason for that is that while the Mass Health rules are that if you're in a nursing home, in order to qualify for Mass Health and therefore have Mass Health pay the nursing home, you have to have less than $2,000 in countable assets, which isn't very much. And remember, Frank and Mary had a lot more than that. But Frank, as the spouse at home, can own the home itself as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000. Can also have cash or cash equivalent assets of up to $119,220 and can have infinite income. Therefore, if Mary was in a nursing home, and Fra it, it, because that was the only possibility as far as the two of them were concerned, Frank could fairly quickly qualify her for Mass Health by simply transferring all assets to, to himself and then buying an annuity. It, to the, uh, with the money that he has over $119,220, he could always buy an annuity, as long as that annuity calls for monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's life expectancy. The purchase of that annuity in any amount could be a million dollars, right? In this case, it would be several hundred thousand dollars. But the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from an asset to an income stream. And the day after he did that, Mary could qualify for Mass Health. The other thing that Frank would want to do is probably change his will so as to specify that all the things that he was going to leave to Mary if he died instead go in trust for Mary's benefit naming one or more of the children as trustees. If he did that and he, all the assets were in his name and he died, all the assets would be immediately safe. Mary could continue to be on Mass Health or could qualify for Mass Health and none of those assets would be lienable. Okay? So there is a clear alternative if, if, yeah, if Frank feels, and Mary, but especially Frank at this point, that he has to pull the trigger because there's just no other way in terms of caring for Mary. Now, one of the reasons why Frank would do that was because he would figure, oh my God, you know, once again, we've got all these assets, um, but, but there really is no alternative because she really can't stay at home because I can't take care of her. Well, and, and in, that case, in that case, you need to understand as far as Frank is concerned, there are two alternatives to the nursing home. There is home um, or there is the assisted living. So the way home would work, Frank, Frank, needs to understand this, and you folks need to understand this. If Mary wanted to stay at home, and Frank wanted her to stay at home, Mass ha but she was otherwise eligible for the nursing home because of her condition, then MassHealth will also pay for a lot of that home care through a program called the Frail Elder Waiver, or FEW. As long as her income, as long as just her income is less than that number, $2,199 per month, and as long as the, the so-called aging services access point, the kind of social services agency that covers her area, um, certifies that Mary was eligible for nursing home care, but, but could get enough care at home. In that situation, and by the way, the, the, the aging services access point here in Ashland is something called Bay Path Elder Services. If, the, if they certified that, then Mary could qualify um, for Mass Health as long as she has less than $2,000 in countable assets and less than this amount of income. And in that case, basically MassHealth will pay for a lot of her home care. What is a lot? Probably up to about 50 hours a week of home care. So MassHealth would pay for a lot of home care to keep Mary home. So the question for Frank in that case would be, 
is Mary only needing that amount of home care? Because once again, you could just shift all the assets to Frank and qualify her for this. And if she's gonna need less than that amount of home care, then that could all work out. As long as Frank's comfortable with home care coming in all the time to his house. And as long as he still feels that Mary's gonna be safe in that environment, right? And as long as he still feels that he's gonna be okay, because he, at this point, is really providing most of the home care. So the question is, can he deal with those things? And if he's saying to himself, this is just gonna be way too stressful for me to be trying to deal with this all the time at home, um, then the question is, does he wanna look at another alternative? And the other, alterna and, and the other alternative, really, in this case, is assisted living. Now, one of the things that I recommend to all of my clients who are having any of these kinds of issues is when you're trying to figure this out, you need somebody who is there with you, who understands the medical side of things, and therefore understands kind of what your condition is, what your drugs are, all of that, who understands the social side of things and can kind of work with all your family members to help you figure this out. Those people didn't used to exist, right? Until about 10 or 15 years ago, there really wasn't anybody. People would ask their lawyer for this, but I wouldn't know. I can't read medical charts, I don't know, right? Or, or to try to figure out the fa family dynamics, I do law, I can't figure out, I know a little about family dynamics, but not a lot. Uh, then a field has arisen um, called, for many years, geriatric care managers. These were mainly people who were either nurses or social workers um, who decided that they would specialize in basically helping people figure all of this out, basically doing case management for older people. Um, the best in this area are a team called uh, Deb, Deb Gittner and Linda Sullivan. That's them, Elder Care Resource Services. That's her, Deb Gittner. So I asked Deb to come and talk about these issues. If you're at the point at which you're even thinking about this stuff, but you're just overwhelmed by trying to figure it out, you should talk to them. And so Deb, could you just talk to these folks about, about these My issues? Thank, Thank you. you. You know the slide? You know how to do this? Uh, right. I think so. Well, I'm gonna tell Deb, so that's forward, that's, that's forward. back, and that's all I know. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you very much. As Arthur said, my name is Debbie Gittner, and I am a certified social worker and also certified through Aging Life Care Professional, Li Aging Life Care Association. I'll give you just a little bit about the role of the geriatric care manager or aging life care specialist. We just went through our national organization. We've renamed ourselves and rebranded ourselves. So, I'm never going to remember. So <laughs> neither. You're always going to have to say, I used to be a geriatric care manager, and now I'm this other person. Now I'm this. And some people still, Linda and I still say geriatric care manager because for those that have used geriatric care managers, it's a well known name. What we do as geriatric care managers, Linda and myself together in our business and many other models, as Arthur said, that are solo practitioners as a social worker and or a nurse, what we do is we are the liaison. If you think of a spoken wheel, we are able to provide resources, assessments, information through the entire aging process. And that allows families to be able to make the best decisions at the time for their relative because many times it can be very stressful, it can be very frustrating, family members can not always be united on the same page of what do we do now, and so we go in as objective professionals with well over 35 years of experience working with seniors, understanding how this medical maze works. And this is, again, just another slide that discusses how we work, how we monitor our, our clients. We ensure the needs are met. We communicate to everybody. We advocate for our clients. Um, we provide education to everybody. We also mediate family conflicts because even in my family, we don't always agree all of the time. Today, I'm here to talk a little bit about dementia. And here are just a few statistics. Right now, it is estimated that more than 5.3 million people are living with dementia. That is huge. It is the sixth largest, sixth leading cause of death in the United States. And that was again today reported in the Middlesex News, Metro West newspaper today, there was an article. Um, and if you just look at the cost in 2015 right now, 
It is the, by Medicare and insurance, insurance companies are estimated to pay $226 billion with half the cost paid by Medicare. $226 billion. It's a lot of money and there are a lot of people who need resources, who need care. Um, and it's nice to know that they're able to get it. Also, one in three seniors die with the diagnosis of dementia. And also, 3.2 million people are women and 1.8 million are men. Um, I think that statistic is because women tend to live a little bit longer. It's the only reason that I can think of that more will, women get the disease because there isn't any other statistic um, explaining why that seems to happen. Dementia memory loss, it affects one's ability to care for oneself and make good decisions. For anybody who's had a relative with dementia, it's a progressive chronic disease that eventually the person who has it is unable to care for themselves. As Arthur said, everybody wants to stay at home. Everybody wants to stay at home. Nobody says, wakes up one day and says to their children, when I get old, please put me in a nursing home. The goal is to stay home. And with memory loss, it is, you are able to stay home. With family increasing visits, with more oversight, with resources being brought in and maybe agencies coming in to help as more care is needed. Families begin to take over more. They begin taking over the bill paying, the medical management, um, med making sure medications are all arranged, all that's involved. And they also worry about safety because with memory loss goes along the risk of a fall. Um, but sometimes, even with the care and family members doing as much as they can, sometimes more is needed. Caregiver burnout, and this is really important to address because so many people are providing care and not taking care of themselves. You go, 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 you're thinking about the other person morning, noon, night, and even wake, when you wake up in the middle of the night, you are thinking about the other person. The phone rings and you jump to look at the number. Is it that? Is it my mother? Is it my aunt? Is it somebody I'm caring for? You worry all of the time. And it can affect your ability to sleep, your ability to eat. It can cause you to have more stress. There's also signs and studies that say the caregiver sometimes dies first before the person with memory loss because you're worried about the bills, you're worried about the food. Pretty soon you're gonna be worried about snow. Who's gonna shovel? How is that gonna be taken care of? Is food gonna be in the house over a snowstorm? And as a result, you're worried about everything and the person with dementia is content, sit, and all of their needs are being met. So it is important for the caregiver to make sure that if they're feeling stressed, they get some support or give themselves a break. It's okay to take a break. It's okay to give yourself some downtime to do something that you really enjoy. When is it time to move to a memory unit? Well, if you ask the senior, it's never a good time, and the answer is always no. One question that we often ask our clients, what would you do if there was a fire in your house? When the answer is, I'll call 911 and leave the house, that's the good answer. Sometimes we've gotten answers, I'll sit in the house and call my daughter. That's not a very good answer. Sometimes I've gotten an answer, I'm just going to put the fire out and I'll go get a towel and put it over the fire. That's not a good answer. Sometimes we've gotten answers, I'll just leave the house and walk away. Good decision, but not necessarily the best choice because the house could burn down and nobody's been called. And they could be standing outside on a very cold, wintry or rainy day. So you have to think about safety first. Can someone manage if there's an emergency? Otherwise, they're not safe at home. Um, also, medications. If they're forgetting to take their medications and you've tried everything you can think of and medications are not being taken, that's very important because medications are given for a reason and if you start missing maybe your high blood pressure meds, you could end up with other complications. 
dressing, not changing clothes, and showering, and eating, all of those skills um, the person is not able to do anymore. Falls, going back and forth to the hospital. Um, also exit seeking, as the disease progresses, not everybody, but some people begin to leave their house believing it's not their home. And then it really is a safety issue because people can walk out at 2 a.m. in the morning looking for their home. Let me now move to what is a memory unit. They provide continual 24-7 care for their residents, which is really very good. It's a locked unit, not because everybody needs to be locked up, but because it's safety. Because if somebody opens a door, they may not know where to go, and it's really designed to be safe for everyone, so that no matter what time somebody walks around, they can always be safe. They help with care. They help with bathing and grooming and dressing and showers. Um, there are activities and socialization. And even though many people say, my, my mother was never social. She'll never join any of these activities. Well, sometimes that still holds true. And sometimes some people become very social because it's just there. And they enjoy listening to music, maybe one activity, and then maybe a second one starts. Everyone feels guilty about the move. Let's face it. It's not what we promised our parents. It's not what we ever expected our parents to, to need this kind of care. But you have to remember, it is best for your relative. It is best for them to get the care, to get the meals, to get the medications, to get the oversight, and it's best for them. Fiblets, you know, ha it very important. You don't need to say to somebody, Mom, I'm moving you here for the rest of your life. You can say, you know, this is a great vacation place. Let's move in. I found a great place. In the meantime, we're going to work on that furnace in your house that's not working so well, and let's, let's take care of the furnace, and then at least you have a place to stay while the furnace is being worked on. Fiblets are wonderful. Um, it is a difficult decision, but remember you're making the best decision, and it's because you love your parents, love your relatives so much that you want them to do their best to stay healthy. How to make the move easy. The best way to do it for your relative is to take pictures of their current home. Anybody with memory loss really lives because, walks around their house by what they see. Everything is familiar. Please don't go buying brand new furniture, putting up brand new pictures, um, buying brand new bedspreads, because the room isn't going to look like their room. It, they may have older sheets, they may have older comforters. Bring it in, because it will feel familiar. I always say take pictures of the bathroom, take pictures of the house, so that when you're replicating the room, you don't have to say, which side was that toothbrush on? Now I don't really remember, because you'll say, oh, it was the right. Was it the right? Was it really the right? With a picture, you can look at that picture and replicate the room similar to home, because people do things by habits. We go to a hotel room. If our toothbrush is at home, always on the right-hand side, we often put it on the right-hand side without even thinking. The same thing with somebody with memory loss. They do things by habit, and you want to continue that habit so it will be an easier transition into a memory loss. Pictures on wall take the same pictures from the house. They look familiar and they provide a comfort level to people. Communicate to the staff. Tell them as much as you can about your relative. Even the bed, that may be something simple, but for years, if they've been married, they've gotten up on the, maybe the left side of the bed when their husband was alive. Don't make it that they have to get up on the right side of the bed. They can't do it. They're still going to try to get up on the left. And so make sure the bed is accessible, that they can get up on the same side they did at home. It may seem, um, you know, it, you, it may be something like, why? But again, habit. We all do it. Do we go to a hotel room and change sides with our husband? Probably not. I don't. My husband's very particular about what side of the bed he sleeps on. And so he can only get up on one side. Favorite food. <laughs> no, you I should meet my husband. 
Um, favorite foods, very important. What is the daily routine? You want to maintain that as much as possible. Also, what causes your relative to feel nervous so that the staff can be easily identified if there is a little bit of anxiety, especially at the beginning. You know your relative, you can look in their eye and say, something's different, they're a little more nervous. The staff can do it, but it may take them a couple of hours to figure it out. Tell them in advance so that they can easily get to know your relative and help them adjust. The, one of the most important things when moving to an assisted living is to read the agreement most importantly, even beyond that, is to have an elder law attorney like Arthur read it. Th these are contracts. You need to know what's written in them, what it happens if your relative has to move out, when charges can be increased. It's a contract. It's a legal co binding contract, and Arthur is very good at reading them and explaining it to you in English. Ask about the fees upon admission. How often can the fees be increased? Um, ask if private help can be brought in because as dementia progresses, sometimes that's needed. And what are the requirements? Does the facility make suggestions? Do you have to go find someone if, someone, if your relative should need more care? How are medications dispensed? Um, is there a respite program? Respite is a wonderful option. It allows you to stay in an assisted living and try it out. And so many of the assisted livings allow that for sometimes a week, sometimes a month, sometimes a little bit longer. And you have a sort of trial period. And it's nice because you can then feel like you have an out. But don't think of it like that. And don't say that to your relative. Really go in with the intent to stay. Ask about, there are a few assisted livings that offer government assisted programs of low incomes. Very, very few in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But if they exist and money's going to be an issue, find out where they are. Um, and ask about hospice, because as the health changes, the idea is to age in place in an assisted living and not to move again. And you want to find out what happens when they need care now and as the disease progresses. Always tour a few facilities. Ask the same questions at each facility. Ask, does the facility perform quarry checks? They do here. Um, I know that for a fact, I've asked that question. Um, and the staff here has, although it's a new facility, the staff has, many of the staff members know each other from working at other facilities. So it may be a new team, but they all have known each other and all have been brought in. Somebody has brought somebody else in. So the team here is excellent and works very well together. Um, think about, you know, nothing is perfect. I sometimes disagree with my husband. Um, but ask about if there's a complaint or a disagreement, how do they work it out? There are going to be issues. Life is never perfect, but how they resolve issues is most important. And what is the process? Because you need to know that if something isn't right. Look at the activities calendar. Check out the food. I've tasted the food here. It's really good. Um, it is very good. And, and make a decision. Have a list. Prepare in advance. Think about where you would want an aging relative to go if they become in need of care. If you have that plan in place ahead of time, you've done well, it's better to tour now. Maybe when you don't need it, make a plan. And when you do need it, you look at that list and you've got ac you're ready to take action. Now, thank you. So that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Um, it really is. And, and by the way, I'll give you a, I'll give you a website at the end. I'm, we're really pleased that um, the folks from Ashland Cable were kind enough to come and, and, and uh, tape this. So that's gonna, this is going to be rebroadcast on Ashland Cable. Also, my friends Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. And we upload all of all the presentations we do to the YouTube channel. So if you, you've seen a lot, of, a lot of information, you want to see it again, or you think somebody else should see it, you've got access to those places. I asked Emily Boschemann to come and speak to you for a few minutes because Emily is in charge of the memory neighborhood here. Until maybe about 10 years ago, it was really rare that an assisted living community would have in it a memory neighborhood, a memory care neighborhood, a place where even if you were really having trouble remembering things and you were kind of, kind of slipping, there was a place where you could be safe, still be with your spouse, and once again, the assisted livings are designed really well for that because 
one spouse can be in a memory unit, right? And the other spouse doesn't necessarily have to be, can be in, in one of the other units so that you can be staying together um, and, 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 and feel that you, you can still stay connected, but at the same time, your spouse is really safe. So I asked Aunt Emily to kind of describe the way in which the memory care neighborhood works and how the folks interact be within that neighborhood and then within the broader community. Emily, thank you very much for coming. Hi, I'm Emily Ann Boschman. So I run the memory care downstairs. Um, you have to keep speaking. Oh, that's right. Sorry, you'll have to keep reminding me to do that. Um, so I do. I run the memory care downstairs. Uh, we like to incorporate all of our programs together. We think it's key to be able to kind of have people transition into memory care and be able to function within the environment so it's friendly, functional, and forgiving. So we want people to come in and feel like they can function there, um, that we're not gonna set them up to fail, uh, that they are gonna have a routine, there's structure, there's understanding there, there's people that are trained there. Um, I think that's a big part of memory care for, for our residents to really feel like they have choice, they can make decisions, um, they have independence, uh, they have a say in what goes on every day for themselves. Um, I'm sorry, what, I'm like losing myself here. So we do incorporate different programs. So we actually are collaborated with Brigham and Women's and Harvard. So we keep our residents actively engaged. So doing exercise programs, Tai Chi, we feel like people will stay where they're in their dementia longer if they are socially active, physically active, cognitively active. So we want to keep people engaged, whether that's in large group activities or smaller group activities. Um, and I think you had said earlier, Deb, that some, you know, some people come in and they say that my mother will never be engaged. Well, we look at that and we look at the person and not everybody does well in a large group activity or a large group setting. So we're not going to set that person up to fail and we're going to look at who they are as a person and we're not going to look at the disease. So we're going to say that maybe we're going to put that resident with a smaller group that she can engage with, only one or two people. Or we look at somebody else that likes a large group, they're an extrovert, they want to be out there, they want the attention. So we're going to put them with a large group and we're going to involve them in the large group activity. So the whole goal is to keep people out and socializing and not isolate. Um, that's big for us. The other thing is, is we will come over to our traditional side and we like to collaborate. So we'll do activities together. Um, we still want to offer drinks for our residents so that they feel independent. Everybody wants a glass of wine sometimes, right? So I go out and we'll purchase um, alcohol free uh, beverages so that they can still interact and, you know, be adults, right? We want to sit down. We want to relax. We want to have those options. Um, we'll also come over, we have live entertainment. So the whole goal is to keep people active, happy, and engaged. Uh, we don't want to see people decline. We want to see them flourish and do well. And a lot of the time when you bring them into assisted living, there's like that 30 day, 35 days of transition period. And then once they're accustomed to the environment and they get a feel for it, and we do set it up so that it mimics their home, so that it is failure free and it is functional, and they go in and they can be independent by grabbing their toothbrush and doing those things by themselves, but also having the support of our associates coming in and being able to guide them. So maybe they can brush their teeth, but all they need is for somebody to put that toothpaste on there for them. And by talking to the loved one and figuring out how independent they were at home, we can mimic that here in assisted living. Um, we pride ourselves in that. We actually ask that a form be filled out prior to moving in so that we know who the resident is, what their home-like situation was, so that we're not asking them to come in and be able to do things that they're not able to do. So that's really big, I think, here. That's great. Thank you right. very much. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the, kind of one of the reasons that people get deterred from coming to assisted livings, they're all, they, there is a myth, well, it's not totally a myth, but it is kind of a myth that nobody can afford it. I mean, only rich people can afford it. But I do want to, just want to go back to some of the stuff that Emily was just mentioning. So I started doing this, my mother died in a nursing home, you know, so that was when I started getting really interested in this. That was way back in 1991, back when nursing homes cost $3,000 a month. And it was bankrupting my dad because it was costing. So, but, so I remember those issues and I've seen it play out. I've been doing this now for a long time. And one of the things I've really come to appreciate about folks with Alzheimer's, like my mother, folks with dementia, 
I mean, there's, I don't want to say there's a good side to this. One of the nice things about Alzheimer's, though, is it doesn't hurt, you know? Folks aren't always in pain. And that a lot of the trouble with having dementia is, doesn't really come from the fact that you can't remember things, but from the way that other people are treating you as a result of the fact that you can't remember things. And I know, that, I know in, in, we're working actually very closely in, in several communities right now, in Hudson, Marlboro, and Northboro. There's a group of communities really looking to try to make the whole community become a dementia-friendly community. And the, really the definition of that is to really have people in the general community be able to talk to you, even if you're having trouble having memory loss and you're a little bit confused and, and feel comfortable with that. Because I think many people find once there's somebody that has dementia, they start isolating themselves because they're embarrassed and their friends stay away from them because they don't kind of know what to say to them because they don't, they're not used to talking to somebody with dementia. Well, if you're in that situation, because that is the norm now in neighborhoods and communities that, you know, dementia is kind of, Alzheimer's, I would say, is considered to be kind of, it's not a disease, it's like an embarrassment, you know? Oh my God, they can't remember anymore. And so for the, per, for the person with dementia, if you want to, find an environment where that person at the end of the day, even if they can't kind of remember everything they did that day, at least knows that they had a great day. Well, that person needs to be dealing during the day with people who can speak Alzheimer's, who, can, who are aware that, of the memory loss and can therefore keep their conversations really in the present uh, and keep their conversations related to things of that person's past because they know that person's past. And that's kind of what you get in a memory care community and assisted living, is folks who are trained to do that. And also folks who, well, they're like Emily. You, you don't get a lot of grouchy people that work in these units, right? Grouches don't want to be in these units, you know? So it's mostly people who are pretty happy and, you know, good people. So let me talk a little bit about money. Um, I'm going to make some assumptions here. In an earlier slide, I said, you know, so we're going to assume that Frank and Mary are 80 years old. Because while you may very well come to assisted living to live if you're quite a bit younger than that, typically if you've got serious memory loss issues, you're going to be 80 years old or over. Not always, but typically. So these kinds of questions about should you be here and, and have one of the spouses in a memory care unit is typically going to, typically going to happen then. So let's make some assumptions. First of all, um, if, they are, if, if in this situation, Frank and Mary, Mary needs to be in the memory care unit. Chances are that Frank and Mary are both gonna be here because one's gonna wanna live in one part of the building or in the memory care unit with the other spouse. So chances are, in this case, Frank and Mary are gonna be selling their house and moving to here, which means they're gonna have about $950,000 to play with because remember they had a house worth 600,000. They had other cash or cash equivalent assets of 350. So I'm going to assume that they've got $950,000. Um, we're going to assume that because one spouse is in a memory care unit, the total cost of that is about $8,000 a month because it's expensive. It is expensive um, because, the, because there's more staffing involved and stuff in a memory care unit. So the assisted living, we're going to assume, is costing $96,000 a year, a hefty sum. Remember their income? Um, and, and we're going to assume also that in addition to spending that money, they are still gonna spend some money, Frank and Mary, on fun, on other things. Maybe Frank's gonna be going out to eat. Maybe, you know, they, they're gonna be spending some money on other things. So let's assume they're spending $1,000 a month. So they're, they're really spending annually $108,000, obviously a lot of money. But if you assume that their expenses are $108,000 a year, or excuse me, $108,000 a year. Remember their income, Frank's income was $2,000 a month and Mary's was $1,000. So their total income was $3,000 a month or $36,000 a year. Minus that income means that their burn rate, the rate at which they are spending their savings is $72,000 a year. If they took all $950,000 and spent, and they burned away their savings at that rate, and this assumes that those savings are making no interest, no interest, okay? If they did that, th then they could stay at assisted living for 13.13 years. Now, Frank and Mary may say to themselves, gee, that's not very long. We're only 80 now, right? And, you know, and our parents died before then, but everybody's living longer, so that may not be long enough. And, you know, everybody's goal in life, among other things, is to not outlive their money. You know, you don't want to run out of money. So let me just talk about two possible alternatives. One uh, would involve Peter. Remember there is Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And I'm assuming that Peter 
uh, is doing okay, right? Maybe he's not a big time, you know, high priced lawyer, but, but he's doing okay. We, and he and his wife are doing okay enough that they're in a 33% tax bracket. That's a very common tax bracket in Massachusetts because typically if you're doing okay, you're paying 28% tax or you're paying 28% federal tax and then the Massachusetts income tax is 5%. So you're in a 33% bracket, right? Now, the, 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 one of the interesting things about being in a memory care unit is that if, if, a, if a healthcare professional, doesn't have to be a doctor, certifies that the person who is in the memory care neighborhood needs to be there, needs to be there for medical purposes, and because they need, they need that supervision or they need assistance with the activities of daily living, eating and dressing and bathing and toileting and transferring, getting around, things that are very common with folks with Alzheimer's. If a medical professional certifies that, then the entire, and if the cost of those activities is built into your monthly rental payment, which it is here, then the entire monthly rent is a medical deduction. It's a tax deduction. Now that's not especially useful to Frank and Mary because they don't have big income, so they don't need a big deduction. But suppose instead of paying this bill out of their own pocket every month, suppose they really trusted their son Peter. They have to, now they have to have trust to trust him in this case. And therefore suppose they give Peter their money, $950,000. And Peter then makes the payment every month. Well Peter is in a 33% tax bracket. As long as Peter is paying more than half of the cost of the support of his parents, that cost of their support is a medical deduction to Peter. They become his dependent and he can make that deduction. So he can then deduct, he can deduct from his federal and state income taxes the $96,000 that he is paying every year. Remember that was the bill. That was the bill for a year was $96,000 which means that, that $31,680 that he was giving to the federal and the state government, he's not giving them anymore because he was able to take this as a medical deduction. Now, once again, this assumes that you trust Peter, but suppose Peter at that point turned around and took that money, $31,680, and put it aside for his parents, right? Because he said he's got this extra money that he just saved, that he didn't pay it in taxes, right? So it isn't like money out of his pocket, right? Um, and he just puts it aside for his parents. Well, then all of a sudden, his parents' income has just gone up by quite a bit, that amount, which means they've still got an annual expense of $108,000. They've still got their old income of $36,000, but now they also have this tax savings, $31,680 that Peter, once again, this isn't a gift from Peter. This is money that he was going to give the federal government but because of this wonderful provision of the tax code, he gets to give it to his parents instead, $31,680. So now their income is $40,320 a year. Their burn rate is 108,000 minus that number, right? Um, their burn rate is only $40,320, right? So now if you take their $950,000, same 950, and divide it by that burn rate, Turns out they can now stay in, that, in, in, in assisted living until for 23.56 years or until they're both 103, provided that they both live that long. That's probably pretty reasonable, right? Now, it may be that in your children's situations, they're in a different tax bracket, and therefore the savings wouldn't be as great, and therefore maybe it wouldn't make it to 23 years, maybe only 20, but, it, but everybody can use this as long as they have some, a child or somebody that they can trust. And by the way, when they gave that $950,000 to their son Peter, that's a, that's a, that's, there's no tax on that, there's no gift tax. And the receipt of that money by Peter is, is, is not taxable as income, it's just the receipt of a gift. So there's nothing bad that happens because they made this gift to their kids. Um, strategy number two is only gonna help you if you were a veteran. Um, but for folks that are this age, at this point, there's a very good chance that they were veterans. Um, if you were a veteran, and you served at least 90 days in active military duty, and at least one of those days, one day, happened during a period of war, World War II, which interestingly ended not when we dropped the nuclear bombs, but a year and a half later, on December 31st of 1946. Um, 
the Korean War, which actually ended for their for purposes of the veterans' benefit in 1954, I think, in January 31st, 1954, not when the fighting stopped. Um, if you serve for one day, then then the Frank and Mary, either Frank Frank, if he has dementia, or Mary as the spouse, is going to be enti entitled to a benefit if, once again, there is a medical professional who is certifying that the services being provided are needed to take care of the person and if those services are part of the rental bill. Same, same standard as with the tax provision, right? And that benefit may be as high as, well, if, it, if in Mary's case, it would be about $1,000 a month or $12,000 a year. If Frank were the one with dementia, it would be $2,000 a month or about $24,000 a year. But I'm assuming, because we've used the case that Mary has dementia. So in that case, the expense has stayed the same, right? $108,000, and remember, that includes all of the bills for the assisted living, plus $12,000 a year for fun, right? Um, their income base has stayed the same, $36,000, but now they've got a veteran's benefit of the extra $12,000, so their, their, their actual available money is those two put together, $48,000. The burn rate on their money is the, is the remainder. The burn rate on their savings is $60,000, and in this situation, their assets get depleted after 15.83 years. So there, are, there may be alternatives. So I guess the, 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 the moral of this story is don't assume, don't assume when you, if, if it turns out that yeah, you could stay at home or you could go to assisted living, there may be safety reasons, there may be social reasons, a bunch of reasons why you'd rather be in assisted living, but you're saying to yourself, I just don't have the money. Well, don't assume that you ha don't have the money. Go talk to somebody about that who kind of knows how you, would deal with, how you would deal with some of these issues to see if you really have the money. That's the goal of the exercise. Um, finally, once again, if you want to see this show again, um, it's going to be on Ashland Cable. It's also going to be on Frank and Mary's, um, Frank and Mary's YouTube, um, uh, uh, cable sta YouTube station. And all of that information is in the handouts for the people who are here. Uh, thank you very, and the goal of all of this always, for any presentation I do, the goal of this is always just to sleep well at night. If this has helped you figure out some stuff, right, and, and perhaps therefore remove some clouds, and you know, that's the thing about getting older, you know, the goal is no longer fame and fortune, the goal is to sleep well at night. If that has helped, then I'm happy about it. Are there any questions from anybody who is here? If not, the folks who are here will be happy to stay around afterwards to answer any particular questions that may be appropriate to you. Could I ask for a quick round of applause for our wonderful guest speakers? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you.